Welcome to the Kentucky Colonel Sports Podcast. Obviously, we're doing this a little bit different this week. We're all either in our homes or in hotel rooms around the country celebrating some awards this week for the Kentucky Colonel, but we're still here to bring you basketball coverage. Guys, introduce yourselves. Who do we have this week? So I'm Cole Park. I'm the sports editor of the Kentucky Colonel, and I'm currently in a hotel in Atlanta for the Pinnacle and Pacemaker Awards Ceremony, but uh, be sure to check out our news podcast next week for more on that. I am Ali Chesnut. I am one of the assistant sports editors, and I am in my lovely bedroom. I'm Colton Johnson, and I'm a sports reporter for the Colonel, and y'all need to know where I'm at. (laughs) And you guys all know me, and I am bringing it to you from the dorm this week, because why not? Um, Well, we are days away from basketball season starting. As of time recording, Kentucky State will be a game tomorrow, but... We've got enough to talk about from the Georgetown scrimmage. Obviously, some struggles early on in the game, but they ended up pulling away as to be expected with Kentucky. What were the biggest takeaways for you guys from that uh, scrimmage? Yes, I'll start it off. Uh, I wanted to say big shout out to Trey Mitchell, obviously, you know, the leading scorer. For the Cats, um, you know, he he was kind of like the team as a whole. He started off a little bit rough, and you kind of started having to think to yourself, you know, is this guy going to see the court this season? Like, he's struggling against Georgetown College right now, but man, oh, man, he turned it on big time. Finished with 22 points, and what was most impressive to me about his game is he was hitting it from deep, man. He, had, he went like four for five from the three-point line. You know, that really just gives this team versatility and options and that's a big thing for Kentucky teams that, especially sometimes in the past, it's felt like the past two years of Oscar Shibwe, it's like, oh, no, I wonder what they're going to do this play. And at this point, you know, especially until they get um, Ugana Onyenso, Aaron Bradshaw, and Zvonimir into the rotation, uh, you really don't know what they're going to do. And that can be very, very tough for opposing defenses. So I think Trey Mitchell uh, stuck out to me a lot for the versatility in his game and how much he turned it on, you know, especially in the second half. Yeah, I'm going to second that. I think Trey Mitchell is pretty much the most exciting player of the game. You know, he played at a really high and he played at a really high intensity on both ends of the court. And, you know, just his ability to kind of stretch the court too. you know, you kind of mentioned it there, his ability to, you know, step beyond the arc and actually hit shots with a guy at his size, I think was amazing to see. But I also want to give a shout out to, you know, I did during the post game show that we did to Antonio Reeves, you know, he showed a lot kind of what he improved on over this offseason. You know, last year we remember him kind of the guy standing in the corner and draining threes all day. Well, the other day against Georgetown, he did a lot more than just that, you know, attacking the rim, spreading the ball. So I thought it was nice to see what Antonio, you know, wants to improve on in the season and be able to show scouts at the higher level. You know, I'm going to start sounding like a broken record here, but uh, highest scoring freshman of the game, uh, Mr. Mr. Dellingham, I'm going to – every single week I'm going to start singing the praises of this guy. <laughs> I'm huge on him. I think he's going to be a big part of this team. I mean, I know he's going to be a big part of this team. We saw what he did in the blue and white game with his 40, 40 bomb and 16 against Georgetown. I mean, he had, you know, everyone had a rough first half. So we're going to kind of look past that, but I'm huge on him. Yeah, I got to agree with uh, that that shout on Rob. You know, I think – Rob gives this Kentucky team something special. And I, I think that he could even help this team more not as a starter. I kind of hope he doesn't start for this Kentucky team and can be that electric six man off the bench. I mean, I think it's so, so important. And I think it goes so underappreciated sometimes in basketball, the impact of that six man, you know, when the, when the momentum starts slowing down a little bit, get someone who you can throw in there, who's going to bring the energy. I've got to talk to Rob a couple times, you know, whether that be at media day after the blue white exhibition, you know, you name it. And that's one thing that he, he prides himself on a lot is that he wants to, you know, whenever that his opportunity comes in, he's going to go out there and he's going to make a play and he's going to bring that energy. And, you know, coach Calipari actually sung his praises after the Georgetown college exhibition for something you wouldn't expect. He actually subbed himself out twice. And Calipari said that meant a lot to him because it showed that this is a guy who's not starting, who is fighting for minutes, but that he's not being selfish about it. You know, he understands he's like, all right, I'm bringing the energy, but I'm starting to get a little low. I need to take a second, come back out. And, you know, I think that especially with a team like Kentucky, where you're used to having so many high, high level recruits, you always hear about the egos and the clashes of egos. And I mean, as respectful as you can say it, you don't get to be a four or five star recruit if you don't have an ego. It just doesn't happen. 
Um, so I think it's so special that, to see a guy like Rob that's buying in so early and that understands, you know, and is willing to make the most of his role. This uh, like this early on in the season, usually it takes well into the season until you see some guys start doing that. Yeah, yeah I said. I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to second basically what he just said. I remember saying during the first basketball podcast of the year that I think he's going to probably be the best option off the bench in the entire country. And I basically, and I, you know, we're seeing it now too. The season hasn't really started yet, but I also said, you know, Wildcat fans shouldn't be upset if they don't see Rob not starting every single game. He's not going to start every single game. There's too much talent ahead of him. So I think he's kind of fine where he gets in and that's where he's going to affect this team and be the best he he can be. Yeah. Real quick before I I get back to you, Alden, you know, just one stat to kind of highlight a lot of this, the bench, Kentucky's bench in this exhibition had 29 points. Rob Dillingham had 16 of those points. So he had over half of the bench's points by himself. And that that's in a game that saw, you know, an entire, another lineup worth of players come off the bench. So Um, And I definitely agree with everything that you guys said. And I think one of the biggest takeaways I had coming into the season was the fact that Cal had mentioned, not only do these guys like playing basketball, these guys like playing together. And I think that's something that maybe we haven't had the last couple of years at Kentucky. Uh, A lot of egos, maybe some clashing personalities. That doesn't seem to be the case at all this year. And I'm really excited to see the way that goes. You also mentioned the fact that maybe you don't want to see Rob Dillingham starting. One player that I really do want to see start is Reed Shepard. He has shown so much, not only in Canada, but against Georgetown, that I, I, I can't see a world where he's not a starter Do you guys kind of think the same way there, or is there something about him coming off the bench that you think maybe will improve his play? Personally, I would actually want Reed off the bench, and I'll I'll give you two reasons for that. One, I think that Reed Reed showed his age a little bit against Georgetown College. He played very well, you know, not his, like, IQ necessarily, but he wasn't as strong as some of Georgetown's players. You know, you're looking at a a Georgetown College, you know, just to get it off – the bat right away georgetown college is no slouch either like kentucky should be beating them significantly but georgetown college is one of the favorites to win all of nai this year and uh, i think that some kentucky fans especially might be severely devaluing how good of an exhibition opponent this was because it was a team that has a little bit of size and a team that can give you a real challenge but one that you should still be able to beat so i actually really like the matchup against georgetown college but uh you know reed was getting a little bit bodied a couple times you know he's got to kind of hit that weight room and and bulk up. And that's not a knock on him. He's a freshman in college and you look at freshman and senior. I mean, look at football. It's, it's worlds apart sometimes. And um, another reason is kind of like Rob big blue nation loves Reed Shepard. They go crazy when he checks into the game. And I think that if you're a coach Calipari, you can kind of use that. You can weaponize that a little bit. If you know the crowd's going to erupt when he comes in, maybe you put him in when the mo- when the, you know the vibes kind of dying a little bit. When maybe you're down a little bit, you know, get the crowd back into it. I was actually talking with um, talking with Sarah, a reporter, a little bit. She was at uh, the women's exhibition today, talking about how it was Education Day and the crowd was going crazy. You know, Colin, you talked about that a little bit, and uh, we talked about you know how much a crowd can actually impact the team. You know, when the crowd is hype the team is getting hyped. The team wants to play better. And if you can weaponize that love they have for Reed Shepard and bring him in at an opportune time to get the crowd back into a game, maybe, I think that could be, you know, a very underrated tool for Kentucky to use. Yeah, 100%. I think Reed, you know, he had his kind of his welcome to college moment. A lot of guys did have their welcome to college moment on the exhibition, their first exhibition playing since July. Let's not remember Let's not forget that either. But I kind of agree everything you just said about him being that spark off the bench. And I kind of like that idea of having, you know, not just one guy off the bench, you know, and Rob, but also in Reed. So I think, you know, this team just has too much talent to be able to fit everyone in. That's just a simple fact. And it's a good problem that Cal has. So I do think that Reed is probably going to be one of those guys that's going to come off the bench and, provide a spark when needed and that's something that I don't think any Kentucky fan should have any negative feelings about I do want to just jump in real quick though and say that I don't think I don't think it'll be a Dante Allen situation either I don't think it'll be a Kentucky loves him but he doesn't play I think it'll be he'll Mm -hmm. play 
I just don't necessarily think he'll be a starter. Which is not a bad thing. It's not, not a all. bad thing. No, not at all. No. I think it's very important. And, you know, kind of also to touch on a point you made a little bit, Alden, about this team, I think you could see a lot of how much they love to play together in this exhibition so much. I mean, there were times where, you know, it was closer than it really should have been, but, you know, especially, and it's always, you always see the kind of stuff in an exhibition, but more so this team than ever, you know, guys trying to give law of opportunities when they're wide open, you know, they could easily take those books for themselves, make themselves look good in an exhibition, but, you know, they want to have fun with their teammates. They're, they're a fun, chippy team to watch. And, you know, they, you can just kind of, you can see the bond they have already. And you can see that they just, they love playing basketball with each other. And, you know, I think that was such a difference maker in the first and second half is in the first half looked a little, looked a little bit rigid. You know, they looked a little bit like some of the things Calipari has been criticized for in the past, looking uh, like guys weren't really comfortable playing the way they were playing. But in the second half, I mean, there were times, Ali, you can kind of jump on this if you agree, because you were there with me, but there were times it looked like they were just in their driveway playing some basketball, you know, having some fun with their friends. And it was, it was great stuff to see when they were turning it on. And you can see that they were leading by one, going into the break, they won 92 to 69. So clearly something changed. And, you know, you talked to, I think you were next to me while I was taught or while we were both next to him, you know, Dillingham talked like, Hey, I was nervous beginning yeah. of the game. My hands were, you know, cold and all this, you know, this was a lot of guys first ever college minute. So it's okay to have a first half where everything's not okay. Now they would have came out the second half and it still wasn't pretty, then we would be asking some questions. But, you know, that's something a lot of the guys Jordan Burks mentioned also, too. You know, he, they were simple as just being nervous, and that's well, an that's okay a, That's why you have, have exhibitions. That's why exhibitions exactly. exist. Exactly, yeah. and this is the first time they've had, you know, meaningful minutes since July, too. You do something yeah. and stop doing it for a few months. You're going to be rusty at the beginning, too. So I wasn't too worried in the first half at all. I thought the response in the second half was the only right response they could have came up with. And, you know, I also talked to Jordan Burks about this too. Apparently, and Cal said it himself, he was not happy at halftime either, you know. So it's nice to know that Coach Cal did get after them and they picked up the pace a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Colin, you mentioned the fact that this was not a slouch of a scrimmage. And I honestly think it may – looking down the road already i know it's a little early to do so it may help through non-conference that we kind of uk did kind of get punched in the mouth in a in a in almost like a reality check in the first half like you're not going to just run over people you got to play and uh they uh, they were forced to really show that they can play in the second half a um, little bit of a shout out to cam brooks harris though for uh georgetown who really did have an amazing game at rup for georgetown yeah, I actually want to say something about Cam, Bro Cam uh, Brooks Harris as well. And that's another reason why I think uh, I agree with your point that this looking down the road, this might be a lot more important of an exhibition than people realize. You know, Georgetown's not a massive team necessarily. They're not like one of the biggest teams or anything, like that, but they have some size, you know, certainly. Um, Brooks Harris, for example, you know, he's, he's not a slouch. And it was one of the things he actually said, I actually asked about it specifically post game. And he, he fully admitted, he's like, yeah, we knew they were coming in without their bigs. And we tried to attack them down low. We tried to take advantage of that. And I think, you know, obviously we don't know the situation with big Z. Hopefully he'll be clear by the time the season starts. Even if he's not, hopefully he'll be clear by the time we get into like some meaningful games, but we don't know. And with uh, Ugana, Onyenso, and Aaron Bradshaw's injuries, we don't know either. So we don't know how long they're going to be without their bigs. But I think it's so important that Kentucky had a team who was very honest about it. It was like, yeah, we were trying to attack them with their size. We wanted to go after them because we knew they were smaller and forced them to adapt to that. And, I mean, Kentucky's not a tiny team necessarily. They've, like, Trey Mitchell's not a small guy. But, like, um, they're definitely without their bigs. They're without – you know, whatever, how many feet it is like three, seven footers, I think are not playing right now. So I think it's important that they get teams who are going to try, try to attack them like that. Cause we don't know how long they're going to be like that. So it's important. They learn how to, you know, kind of adapt to that weakness and kind of learn how to survive without that strength. And then you can just add it on top of that. Once you have that already going. And one more note on Cam Brooks Harris, that's, he is really not a slouch. He Played two years of Division One basketball at Marshall, who we play later, who UK plays later this uh, this season. I, I, I think that it cannot be overreacted to the fact that Cam had a really good game. 
we're gonna have we're UK is going to play people this year that have good games. It's just a matter of can UK overcome the good games to still get a win like they did against Georgetown. You say players are going to have good games. I think that's, you know, it's almost like a, a joke in the Kentucky community that everybody comes into Rupp Arena and becomes <laughs> Steph Curry or something like that. Like they're hitting every shot from deep. You know, that's that's something Calipari talks about every year. You're Kentucky. It doesn't matter even in a down year. You've got a target on your back and everybody wants to give it all, all they've got to beat you. So I agree. It certainly is important that you, you know, you're going to have to play guys who are playing way better than that. They might even play for the rest of the season or up to that point. But, you know, you got to, you can't just make excuses about that. You got to kind of roll with the punches and, you know, good teams, um, good teams execute when things are going well, bad te- or great teams execute when things aren't going well, they can, they can turn it around. You can really tell the difference between a good team and a great team when they get punched in the mouth, how they respond to that and how they react to adversity. Does anybody else want to comment on the Georgetown scrimmage before we kind of move on a little bit? All right. Well, today we had the education day for women's basketball. You got to go to that. Was there any big takeaways from that for the the women's team? If you pack Rupp full of fifth graders, you get the most electric environment in the world of sports. I mean, (laughs) those kids, they're probably the only humans I've ever seen follow the make some noise banners that they run across the, you know, the little screens, but no, I mean, they looked they looked really good. I mean, Kentucky State's a really small team. So if you looked at the stat sheet, you saw the game that Aja Petty had. She had 19 points, 13 boards. But she was, I mean, and she's good. Don't get me wrong. She was preseason MVP. I mean, Kyra Elsie loves her for a reason. But she was playing against people that were scraping six foot. She's six four. They didn't have an answer for her. They couldn't reach, grab anything off the glass. I mean, the second chance points for her were great. I mean, it was... She was eight for eight in the first half, so she couldn't miss, and they had no answer. So it kind of like was a perfect storm of Kentucky State. You know, it's not I one. There, I definitely think there's something to be said, though. You know, I, I touched on it a little bit uh, with the point about the men's team and uh, about Reed Shepard, but you know, like I was talking about with Sarah, you know, I think people underestimate how much the crowd impacts a team, and you know, not to. <laughs> Not to kind of diss on the team at all, but you know, playing yeah. in Memorial Coliseum every year, yeah. there's you've been to some of those games. It's pretty empty in there a lot of the time, and um, it's it's baffling to me that people see an empty stadium and then wonder why is the team not playing good? Why are they looking demotivated? Why are they looking dead? I mean, because it's kind of a cycle. It kind of repeats itself. The team plays bad. The people don't show up. The people don't show up. The team plays bad. It kind of goes hand in hand. But you know, we just kind of had a conversation about you know like you said, with the fifth graders and the the electric atmosphere, how much that means to the players and how much that can take a team who's struggling a little bit and give them that extra boost they need. I mean, you hear it all the time with through all kinds of sports, home home field, home court advantage. Kentucky's not, not always a team that's necessarily always had that in women's basketball. You know, there certainly there are times it has, for sure. You know, some SEC games do get pretty good crowds, but a lot of times – and you know it is what it is and you can say the same thing about the men sometimes with rep arena it's kind of uh, gotten a reputation sometimes for having some of the uh the older crowd um right there where the yeah. student section should be arguably but um i think it, it's huge for the for these women to have that kind of atmosphere and especially this early on you know last year was a very very rough year for this team and they they struggled quite a bit so you know having these kids come <laughs> out and having these kids be hyped and ready to go to start the season i think i think it's a good boost for the team certainly getting going Absolutely. Me and Sarah were trying oh. to talk about a way to formulate a question in the press conference after that wasn't didn't have that disrespectful tone of you know when talking about the crowd you know yeah. you're like oh well y'all are used to like used to playing like it we figured it out so I mean certainly but, it's not all their fault either I Memorial mean, Coliseum yeah. before the renovations was not the nicest venue to go into it had no air conditioning but luckily you know hopefully when that's done by I'm hoping next year uh, it'll be yeah. a much nicer environment people will actually want to go to. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, especially when Memorial Coliseum is done, it's going to be right off the campus. Gor- hopefully, it looks to be a gorgeous venue. Uh, I'm really excited to just be able to walk over, see a game, cheer for the for the women's team. And it's, it makes a fun and easy uh, easy game to go to. And hopefully they switch uh, Big Blue Madness back over there, too. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, I'll tell you one thing I didn't like about the women's exhibition, though, and this is, you know, being nitpicky. This is this is exhibition number one. You're going to be a little rusty, but don't like the 66 percent from the free throw line. I mean, come on, ladies, let's let's come on. I mean, I'm, and this is a problem with Cal Perry's team as well. This is not just me hiring the women's team, but like Kentucky players in general, like those are free points. And I, I, I sound like such an old head every time I'm going to get on that. But like those are free points. You cannot miss your free throws. And they're, they're you know, rusty. They are rusty. I understand that, but like it's just it's indicative because you've seen both teams. I mean, the men's team is one that always bothers me so much with this, but a lot of times they're rusty, but they never really become unrusty. Sometimes, and <laughs> I just I want to call it out early. I want to get on it now, so it's not you know, so it's not like I'm just bringing up nothing later on. Like I want to say I saw you know they they were 21 for 32 from the free, 32 free throws is outrageous in an exhibition first of all, but. 21 for 32 they missed 11 free throws and the win i mean ended up being by 17 points but 28 points sounds nicer than 17 you know well i lucky for you cole i know that kyra is kind of a psychopath when it comes with making sure her teams hit free throws so i'm pretty sure those girls got their work i think they uh heard a little might a meaner way of what you just said about having <laughs> to hit free throws. That's probably fair. She she's one who, uh, you know, especially depending on her mood in the press conference, she's she's not going to sugarcoat some things. And I've heard her, I've heard her say, you know, like those some of those players are going to be in some trouble for sure for missing those. I want to try to look at uh, who who missed some in particular. It looked like uh, Asia Petty three for, three for eight. Yeah, three she was a big The other I one, think Christmas, last year. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to talk about it when she she didn't get into like third fourth end of the third fourth quarter, but one of the freshmen, Janae Walker, she's you know supposed to be fill that big man role. Well, she got to the line a couple times and one for four. <laughs> me, me and Sarah did have some comments about her free throws. I mean the <laughs> the four. She's a good basketball player. I think she's going to be great for this team. And Kyra Elzey talked about after the game how her. Her and uh, Jordy are going to have to fill big roles as freshmen. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, when she stepped up to the charity lot, charity strap, it was it was pretty funky looking. Respectfully, it was. I've got it. confidence, though. I've got confidence in Elsie that she's going to be on her about that for sure. You know, oh, I don't want to. Sure. I didn't want to discredit anything there. Kyra Elsie is going to be on that. You know, that's something 100%. that she's always been about. 100%. I'm pretty sure last year she's mentioned something like if someone had a bad game at the line, they can't leave the gym the next day until they make not in a row, but until they make 300 free throws or something like that. Which I think is, she needs a lot I of. I think free throws. she needs to up it up to about 500. To up to about 500. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the box score here, and good lord, Kentucky State. Two players fouling out, one on four fouls. That's – come on now. What are we doing? This is exhibition number one. <laughs> they were hacking. I mean, they didn't – some of the girls that were down in the post trying to guard Asia Petty were I, – I was taller than them. I felt awful. And, like, there's nothing they could do. But Those, those are uh, those are blue-white game uh, Jordan Burke's numbers right there. Uh, I mean, Cal Perry said before the blue light game said nobody's fouling out and Jordan Burks had like eight I think like it was ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> he said no one's fouling out all right I'm in so I mean, no but no a player I want to see a little bit more from the women's team and you know like we can talk about they're rusty so you know they're, they're working on it and I'm sure that'll come but you know Cassidy Rowe had a rough night going over for four um, from the field zero points in the night but she's one that I think um you know, once some of that rust shakes off and she can actually, you know, really find her comfort in her shot. I think that Cassie Rose is going to be one to watch out for this year. You know, she's another one kind of like reading away, like the fans love her. You know, she's a, she's a local here to Kentucky and um, you see her dad on Twitter all the time, always commenting on everything. <laughs> and he's, he's big on it. And, you know, she's coming back after, you know, a year of um, a year of kind of being quieter, you know, young year, freshman year, you know, but um, I, I hope I'm expecting her to kind of make a jump and to see a little bit out of her. I'm very excited to see um, if she can have a big year, especially, you know, as kind of like the future of this team, because this is a team that, you know, right now is kind of led by Maddie Shear, but one yeah. that you're going to have to start, you know, this year is obviously the priority, but you also want to develop players for next year as well and kind of have that cycle going because you don't want to have, you know, 
you don't want to be the team that's good one year and really bad the next. You want to be able to start building a consistent cycle, especially if Kentucky wants to be a perennial team in the SEC and they won their first SEC title in 40 years, two years ago now. And if you want to, you know, repeat that, compete with your South Carolinas and your other big teams, the SEC, you need to build that consistent ground and, and uh, foundation. The next I kind time, of want to. Oh, go ahead. I was just kind of go off, you know, Cassidy right there because I think the problem. It's, I'm going to say problem because she's still young. I mean, last year was her freshman year, obviously, but you know, Cassidy, she hasn't really taken advantage of many opportunities that she has seen the floor. She kind of saw the floor now and then last year. And there's kind of yet to have been the she's arrived the moment. And I thought maybe yesterday was going to be one of those for her. And it's kind of still yet to happen. You know, it's kind of like the team as a whole, just kind of wait a little bit. It's still early doors. We haven't even had an official game yet, but it might be something to keep an eye on as far as, you know, where are we going to see the Cassidy road that made Kentucky women's basketball fans so excited to have her come here when she was in high school. So I think need to be on a lookout for a big game from her coming up. When soon. she, when she does have that big welcome to Kentucky moment, it's going to be electric though. I can guarantee that, you know, especially if it's in Rupp arena, it's going to be electric. They love Coach, those 606 girls over Coach, there. So Coach Elsie talked about her after the game. She said she's, she's kind of a glue person. Like she works her tail off. She's never worried about her coming off the floor with any energy left in her. So if anything, you know, that's always good. But the next time we all get together, we will have actual basketball to talk about, which is going to be great. Is there mm-hmm. any, I, I don't want to say predictions, but anything that you guys could uh, foresee that we may be talking about a week from now when it comes to uh, the first game or so of uh, both the men and the women's side? This will be bold, but I think Kentucky might beat New Mexico State. No. <laughs> no, I, I actually don't have a ton to say. New Mexico State's a weird one because if I recall correctly, and I, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they have to cancel the rest of their season last year after uh, an unfortunate tragedy within their program? But um, They did. Yeah, so I, I really have no idea at all what to expect out of that team. I, I haven't followed as closely as to kind of who they've lost and who they're getting back. I know – you know, typically they're a pretty big team, and uh, I think they're usually in the WAC, the Western Athletic Conference, I believe. I don't know if they're in that again this year. I know that they're one of the teams that moved to, is it um, Conference USA? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah. So they'd be in Conference USA yeah. this year? Um, I don't know. I'll have to check that. All right. Well, regardless, they're, you, they're, they're typically a team who you would see in the NCAA tournament after winning the WAC. So uh, if they go back to that, then I think it'll be a tougher exhibition than maybe some people give it credit for because they're a team, if I recall correctly, again, a few years ago, they almost pulled off an upset. If not, they did, might have, um, over one of – it was either UConn or Arkansas, one of the two. I think they might have upset UConn two years ago. I think I might remember. I think they might have. I was just going to say, I remember seeing them in a few tournaments yeah, I, I think know, they, every I think now and then again. So, again, they can't come out the way they did against Georgetown they, against yeah, a better, no, they're, obviously no, a better they're, team. They're, no. A team that, you know, is is used to making NCAA tournaments for sure. Last year was certainly an exception because of the cancellation there, but I believe they did. I think they did upset UConn and Arkansas almost got upset by Vermont, but ended up pulling out and winning that one. And then beat New Mexico State in that year. So I think I think that's what yeah. happened two years ago. That would have been Kentucky's St. Peter's year. So most Kentucky fans probably checked out of that one. But um, no, I certainly agree. They're, they're going to have to come out significantly better against a team who's used to playing in the postseason, who's a D1 caliber team that's, you know, especially one with probably some players who are looking to kind of put their name back on the map after an unfortunate situation last year. Yeah, yeah just just some things to look uh, to look at. Uh, this is a team that did not miss the NCAA tournament, but twice in their in the 2010s. So that's something to look out for. <laughs> and uh, they are in Conference USA this season. This will be their okay. first time in yeah. Conference. USA. I, I kind of thought so because they, they, it was them, Sam Houston, Jacksonville State, and Liberty that moved. I believe. Yes. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming on the show. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, I hope. Kentucky is one and zero in both sport in both the men's and the women's side when we meet next time, and uh, thank everybody for listening, and we'll see you next time.